Uh, hi, welcome to Politics for People Who Hate Politics, episode six. I have no ability to retain how many episodes we've done, but um, so I always up talk about it. Today on the panel, we have usuals, Corey, Michelle, and Joe. Say hi to the people. Hello. Hi, people. <laughs> They're very unenthused today, but I'm Great going to... to uh... Shut up, Joe! Mom says make her bed. I um, <laughs> and we also have David Lowenthal, who fails at lower thirds, but we still like him anyway. Yeah. Um, he has a blog called The Forgotten Beard, and we'll ask him to promote that at the end, as we like promoting things here. And... One time he was an intern at the Cato Institute, and we hung out, and he recently moved to Mordor. How is Mordor, by the way, David? Uh, uh, Weather-wise, actually, not its worst, <laughs> I, guess, I guess you could put it. But uh, otherwise, it's it's Mordor for you. Yeah. That's, that that, that uh, about gels with my memory of the place. Yeah. Okay. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about this fine Sunday evening is some stuff about the Poe pose, which is, I suppose, my specialty, but in a world with Radley Balco, that's not uh, not doing much for me. Um, this uh, last week, the Supreme Court basically actually joined the 21st century, finally, and decided that you need a warrant to search someone's cell phone. And they had a whole, but they previously had this whole procedure uh, oh lord, in search incident to arrest, there was a whole thing where they could search your phone, and obviously in this, um, if they pulled you over for, you know, a traffic stop or what have you, which leads to, a, oh, are there any drugs in here? Oh, better search your phone. That's kind of the way of things. Um, the police used to have this great easy way of searching a phone, um, and I guess they won't anymore, which is awesome. Uh, the, the Supreme Court, particularly on the Fourth Amendment, has been kind of slow in terms of um, joining the 21st century and figuring out that, yeah, it's a little more than just your papers that I need to be protected by the government. It's also this kind of thing. Um, so that's good, right? I mean, I, I, I'm always surprised when the Supreme Court makes a good decision, especially about the Fourth Amendment. Um, do you guys have any thoughts to add to this? There's some other, there's some other police stuff um, recently that I can also talk about. <laughs> if you, uh, uh, my panel well, needs. Agree. Like, I mean, does anyone, does anyone think this, this was the wrong decision? I'm pretty sure it's, you know, the, the Supreme Court is, you know, well, right I was, on it. I was Alito kind of surprised because they're usually pretty bad. With yeah, I mean, Alito dissented, but. It was a pretty sweeping decision. It was yeah. eight to one, so that's that's good. That shows at least that they're capable of reading the Fourth Amendment and you know, sort of upholding it even in this day and age. Yeah, and it bodes well for. Um, I, I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I couldn't speak to what this, what else this might apply to, but um, you know, one of the big problems with with um you know, te technology and protecting all your shit in this day and age is the third-party doctrine, which comes from a, I think it's like 1979, they first, um, with phone records, you know, just like landline old-school phone records, um, and basically the third-party doctrine says it ain't your papers if you um, shared the information willingly with the third party, be that a uh, phone company or what have you. And obviously that's been really bad in an era of cloud computing and, and other things, and that's one reason why the, um, the NSA thinks that they can do giant cell phone dragnets because, or phone dragnets and spine dragnets because you turned it over anyway. But, um, so I don't know. I guess this bodes well. Right. It's ironic because they kind of missed the boat on the whole Aereo decision, which came out the same day. Yes. But they don't really, I don't think they really understand technology. That's one of the dangers of having a bunch of old people on the Supreme Court. Forever, mind you. Yes. Right, forever. So they're going to be, you know, making these decisions that greatly affects all of Americans, and they probably 
And do they even know? Who knows what they know about technology? What what they know about cloud computing and all this? It seems kind of dangerous to leave it all in their hands. But you know, it looks like at least on privacy, they're kind of erring against the you know dragnet and the whole. Yeah, I mean, they have a lot. Of, there's a lot of bad precedent, though, that um, that they have to with the, with the cell phone search. You know, if the police have your phone, I think the third party doctrine doesn't apply because they're going through your stuff, um, and you haven't. You know, you may have stuff that's in the cloud on your phone, but in order to search your little phone, I guess um, they decided that that yeah, you need a damn search warrant. But I, I still think that getting rid of the third-party doctrine would be... I don't know if there's anything that would be more helpful in this current, um, the current laws that we have to privacy than getting rid of the third-party doctrine. And I don't know... What was the life expectancy when like, the Supreme Court was set up? I wonder. Maybe we should have like a rule. <laughs> we need some young people for the Supreme Court. With like, millennials in the Supreme Court? That just sounds like a sassy BuzzFeed article that would annoy, a list that would annoy me greatly. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever. We should, we yeah, should. 50, 50 ways to youth up the Supreme Court. <laughs> they had another one about... I, I don't even want to talk about it in case there are children here. Supreme Court Justice. Sexy Supreme Court Justice. That was the day that I was done with BuzzFeed when the self-parody and parody was... Um, it was... It was. They became one. It was a singularity type issue, they I never, think. never looked back. Yeah. Um, now, I'm, I, since I, I'm just going to talk at y'all a little bit more, I've been I've been reading about um, stingrays a bit in the last week. Speaking of more cop and spying stuff, and um, those are those things that your local police might have, and those um, capture sort of I don't know how many phones in an area. It's basically the equivalent of a cell phone tower, but it's not one. It's like a fake cell phone tower that can get metadata, you know, like all the metadata in, in an apartment building and such if you turn it on outside. And I have no idea if those... Those might have the same... Um, the, the same problem. Like this, this, this might actually bode well, this decision, for those as well, because arguably you're also going directly... You're not going to the cell phone company to get records in that. It's more direct, and therefore this decision might actually make those uh, not legal. But we don't even know who's doing them, so I don't know. I don't know. You have to know what people are up to before you can decide you know, if it's going to be legal or not, and that's why the government doesn't want to know what you're up to. Well, I mean, the government doesn't want us to know what it's up to either. I mean, the, if they don't... If nobody knows about these things, then nobody can, you know, they can't really be illegal because no one knows that they're there and they're just going to keep doing it. And they're always going to, you know, be looking for ways around, you know, and whether or not the Supreme Court or whatever rules that they are, you know, something like this would be illegal. You know, until it gets to them, they're just going to keep doing things like this and keep going around until it's illegal. Then they'll just yeah. find something else. And... There's really no, we're, we're all screwed again. Yeah, it kind of comes down to, I mean, this is the best news on spying we've had in a while. Um, you know, and it applies obviously not, it's not just about la uh, confining one agency, and this is, you know, this is an actual protection for all of us. Um, so this is good, you know, there's, there's always a little bit of good news, even when the government's out there, but there's a lot of there's a lot of worrisome things as well. And then a, bad, a lot of bad Supreme Court decisions about the Fourth Amendment that still let the cops kick in your door. Be like, oh, I whispered police. It's not my fault it's 4 a.m. Uh, and you were sleeping 50 feet away in your back room. I whispered it real quiet like. My suspicion is that the, the decision is probably just an outlier. Really? I mean, I hope not, but... Probably kind of likely. I mean, I, I have to see, like, two or three more, like, fairly decisive cases before they, yeah. I, you know, declare victory on the, on the Liberty Front. I mean, it's definitely a positive in the sense that um, prior to this, and I remember reading it in a couple of articles, I think cell phones were classified kind of in the same group of 
you know, as wallets and like these inanimate objects. So it's definitely positive that now at least the Supreme Court, you know, views these cell phones as exactly what they are, which are mini computers uh, and, and much more. But where it goes after that is definitely, I mean, still yet to be seen. It could be, you know, positive or it could be negative or it could be both, so... Yeah, I don't, I don't trust them on Fourth Amendment stuff more than I distrust them on a lot of other things. Um, but they're learning something. They're just, they're always so slow. And it, government can never catch up with technology. Um, you know, it just, it never can, which is great, of course. But in, in, in terms of protections, it tends to be very bad. <sighs> um, what else? What else should we discuss here? Before we move on, though, we should really mm -hmm. just, like, make a note and, like, make sure someone pitches the show Supreme Court Millennials, because I'd watch that. It'd be uh, <laughs> just people arguing, like, hmm, well, we don't like Facebook and, you know, and Instagram, you know, kind of in, like, fighting away at our privacy, but where are we going to post our fair trade coffee <laughs> when we feel like it? So someone someone make a show of that, please. I want Ezra Klein on that. As one of how, the, how about the new yeah. Perry Urza Klein? I think we should invite him, which I find inexplicably like the funniest thing I've read all week. Just Urza Klein. <laughs> oh, oh man, tangent. I feel like the, the Salon parody account. I feel like that's something important we should discuss, but it's not really in order here at all. Um, oh, Wait, Salon parody account. Figured out who it was. It's my fr it's my friend Jordan Bloom and some other guy he knows yeah. from the Daily Caller. Yep. It was the Daily Caller all along. It always is. And there's there's now Vox.com. B a u x. I haven't read enough actual Vox to realize like how funny that is. I just think Urza Klein is funny. I think the term Vox is the term now. With the, the what was that? Vox explaining. Yeah, that's it's better than mansplaining, I guess, because yeah. that's not a real word either. Spe speaking of vox explaining, they just um, they came out with something today about the, the bring back our girls, how it just was totally useless and how nobody's doing it anymore, which I thought was ironic because like two months ago they were saying how it's making a difference, and then they just got. You know, but then it was like it's making people intervene, and that was also bad. Right, like Americans. actual. <laughs> People who are experts on, you know, Africa came in and said, "No, it's not doing anything. It's going to make things worse." Yeah. Uh, I, I just love when Fox gets a little comeuppance. The real lesson is never say, believe, or advocate for anything, right, Joe? Correct. I thought so. No one can call you out on it. Once I googled why is Ezra Klein a thing, but it couldn't tell me. The internet could not <laughs> tell me. I want to know. Ask Siri. Ask Siri what she thinks. Yeah. Um, all right. I have some other things we should talk about. So I'm getting kind of, I mean, this is not new from conservatives, but because there's that unfortunate uh, humanitarian issue on the border with more and more um, children, many of whom are unaccompanied, and often from Central American countries so that you can't just be like, uh, get back over there in Mexico two feet away. That's happening, and that is causing a major influx and invasion of conservatives being complete douchebags. Um, and honestly, I don't resent them for being concerned about it or being like, well, my tax dollars, blah. What I am annoyed by is them being incredibly xenophobic, borderline racist about all this, and talking about it like it's the Mongol hordes come to rape their women and steal all their germs. And, like, all I want them to do... I tried to write about this for Rare, and all the comments were like, why is there a liberal writing for Rare? Just, like, stop pretending that these people are bad, because... Just... Yeah. Immigration people, what, what, do we have thoughts here? Libertarians occasionally disagree on this, I know, but um, at least maybe not going all Drudge Report insane about it. Like that's what that's what I ask about this. I think. Well, maybe. like posting headlines every time an illegal immigrant ever commits any type of like jaywalking would be like right, exactly. Drudge Report. I mean, that, well, that's the conservative you know trope right now. They want. They want the, the wall to go up first, and then they can deal with, you know, legal immigration. 
and whatever else. And I don't know. I mean, what can you do really? Other, you can either build a wall or just let everyone in. I don't know. Like the moral outrage about it is so upsetting to me. Like they're making this logical decision to come to America. Um, you know, and, and many of them don't even know that um, in the, the average type of immigration, maybe not the recent unfortunateness with these kids, it's this obvious choice to come over and violate the precious sovereignty of the United States to try to make money, more money than they can make, you know, in Mexico. It's so obvious, and it's markets, and it's people doing stuff for their families, all these conservative values, and yet... Invasion yeah. hordes. The American people are pretty terrible on immigration. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, yeah. This is one issue where I'm glad like Congress doesn't listen to the American people. I was just thinking that, David. That's a good point. I was. I'm really pessimistic about the general, like the general population. I don't think they're all going to murder each other, you know, if there are no laws tomorrow. But I'm a kind of pessimistic about their, like their attitudes towards foreigners. Oh, that just seems like. Yeah, it seems like, like a constant. Like you know. it's like Steve King would be like like a good thing compared to like your average like because it's like you listen to like I don't know every time like every once in a while when you flip on C-SPAN and some caller is like portable you know and it's like like are you serious like are you serious? Well, what do you guys think about sort of the uh, at this point, I don't know how the split is with libertarians, but you know there is there's reason reason type people have always been at, or at least since you know the Nick Gillespie days. I don't know what Virginia Bristrell or before was like, but totally pro immigration. They've done some great stuff where they talked about how there is no line for a lot of the people coming in from you know Mexico from the poor countries. It's not like they they were too impatient to wait. You know, like they were never going to get here ever. Um, but, you know, I, the Rockwell Mises school of people tend to be a lot more of the tinfoil yeah, like, bunker types yeah, yeah, on this. Like, like America is one giant gated community or something, and, like, you've got to defend the... Well, that's the argument they all have. If, if, you know, you point out it's just like a, it's just a voluntary transaction, like somebody moving to another, to another location, then they're like, no, well, we collectively own the United States. <laughs> Right, they compare it to breaking into your house. Sorry, go on. Exactly. What the fuck does that even mean? We collectively, all of a sudden, like we collectively own the United States. I thought this was like actually like free market voluntary principles here, and it's, it's suddenly it's, it's just like like you said before, it's it's just a huge contradiction. Not and not only that with mainstream conservatives, the whole idea of putting up a wall or something. I mean, you know how much money that would cost. They all, yeah. all of a sudden they just don't give a shit about the budget. They just want to keep them out. Mm hmm. And even like that, good people like Amash have to pay tribute to this idea that first we secure the border, and then we talk about the rest of it. And this, the border is pretty damn secure already. And I mean, um, conservatives tend to ignore the fact that American citizens are already getting hassled by immigration laws. Internal immigration checkpoints are legal a hundred miles within either border, north and south. And that's where you get all the YouTube fodder, you know, where some steely-eyed uh, bunker dwellers just says, am I being detained? Am I being detained? Am I being detained for, like, eight minutes? And then, you know, the, the Border Patrol lets them go. Like, American citizens are getting hassled by uniformed federal officers, and conservatives want more of that. Again, ridiculous. I mean, it all, I guess it all goes back to just they don't want brown people in the country. I mean, yeah. there's no real other reason. It's not, I mean, it's good for the economy. Mm -hmm. It brings in you know, new jobs. Corporations and companies like it because they can you know, hire people for less than minimum wage or whatever because it's illegal anyway. And that, mm -hmm. that's the reason you know labor unions are against it. And There's plenty of Democrats who don't want it either, but I mean, what, what exactly do conservatives have to complain about other than they fear that they'll all vote Democrat or whatever. They well, they'll, they'll they, think that, and start they think they're all going to be on welfare and that they're all going to kill everybody. <laughs> like, they think that there's this crime wave coming from illegal immigrants. 
And there's this faulty statistic about, like, I don't know how many, like, Americans are killed by illegal immigrants every five minutes or something, but there's, uh, it's bad. It's World D Net Daily Drudge Report style lunacy is what it is. Well, another thing I like to, like, uh, fearmonger about is, like, oh, they're going to come in and, like, destroy our culture. Right, like, right, the know, happy cannon argument. Culture. Yeah. Yeah. It's just absurd. I mean, at the end of the day, there are a lot of people in the world who are really deeply boring, I think. And I don't know if, like, these people, like, does Pat Buchanan never go to Mexican restaurants? Like, I actually wonder this. I mean, they're really, really, like, they really want only what they're used to to be around them, in food and language and culture. I remember years and years ago, the paper my dad used to write for, the, the, the conservative paper in town, had this angry letter from someone who went to Best Buy and accidentally bought, like, a movie that was um, dubbed in Spanish. And instead of, you know, noticing that before she purchased it, it was all just like, this is America. We don't have movies dubbed in Spanish. In and she was so angry. Um, there's, there's so many other countries in the world, too, where, like, there's not just one language being like spoken. Mm -hmm. I mean, all across Europe, you know, there's multiple languages in like every country. Like, I, I don't understand like this effort to preserve like our, our I guess it's a white white culture. I guess is the dominant what culture. What they want, but you know, white culture doesn't exist. It's just a mishmash and amalgamation of all the other cultures that, you know, went into the melting pot back in the 1800s, mm -hmm. 1900s. I mean, if you just... Other countries have some problems with immigration, like France does, um, but other countries in Europe, in spite of the fact that we're supposedly, like, the most racist country, you know, if liberals are talking about it, like, there's some... Other countries have been really... You know that they haven't treated their immigration populations that well. And ideally, if we want to be that awesome America thing, we should welcome them all in without screaming. You know, when somebody, when an 80-year-old from Mexico dares to speak Spanish on a street corner one time, like there's, there's such a reasonable way to go about this. And conservatives are just really making me want to barf whenever they talk about this lately. Yeah, and they always have to go for like the most punitive thing, like the most douchey thing that you could possibly do, which is total deportation. Not like, I think, like, Brian Kaplan came up with the idea of, like, an immigration tax or tariff, which isn't totally libertarian, but it would be better than, you know, absolute deportation. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's still this whole swath of libertarians who don't want, like, they're afraid of open borders. And the, the welfare state argument is sort of a... Uh, you have a point, sure, I'm not, like, I don't want to be like, come get all the welfare, Mexican and other immigrants. But at the same time, you don't do something bad because... You, know, you don't deport everybody or you don't build a wall until the fateful day when we have no welfare state. You know, you don't do bad things because of another bad thing that exists. That's not that's not the small or no government argument to make in my book, in spite of what Matt Drudge or Hoppe has to say about it. Yeah, I think it really shows conservative values that they'd rather preserve the welfare state than have an open society. And they would. They absolutely would. You're right. And yeah, and they're when they demonstrate that they have no ability to tell the difference between the crime of crossing a border and like killing somebody, you know, or they have no idea, they can't tell the difference between breaking and entering and crossing a border. Like they just, I don't want to talk to them until they learn to talk about this in a sane fashion. It's pissing me off. You know, the other, the one other point is, you know, back to the economic factor. You know, without immigration, you know, most of these. The, well, big problem in Europe is all these negative birth rates that are happening, mm. and the economies are shrinking because there's not enough young people working. You know that's that happens to all kind of technologically advanced societies, and it's you know Scandinavian countries were are terribly xenophobic when it comes to immigration in a lot of places, mm -hmm. and they're all gonna be you know they're kind of 
their welfare state isn't going to survive because all these, you know, the same in the United States, all the young people are getting old, all the workers are getting old, and they have no one coming in to replace it because the birth rates are so low. And, you know, that, that could happen in the United States if we decide to just shut off, you know, all immigrants from coming in. It's, you know, conservatives probably don't take into account how much these immigrants help the economy. They refuse to accept it, yeah. Uh, they're terrible. All right. Um, I, as usual, I've lost track of how long we've been at this, y'all. But I say we open it up to an exciting Gary Oldman, blues traveler, political correctness, libertarian celebrity amalgamation topic. And by that I mean, hey guys, do we have thoughts on Gary Oldman, who apparently is a libertarian and also is on apology number, whatever David said, 47, I guess. Um, he was on Kimmel, I think, a few nights ago, backpedaling furiously. <laughs> they do like to do that, people who say things. Now, I don't know if I'm, like, reading into, like, the thing too much, but I think Gary Oldman was making, uh, or at least what he said about the political correctness of our society, um, you know, it, it's an important point about people being vilified, certain people being chosen, and then those people are being vilified, um, and then once they're vilified and um, condemned um, in the spot, you know, then it was like, oh, okay, then therefore, um, there's no way, what am I saying? Just like, you know, this person said X thing about women, um, let's vilify this person, and once right. we do, therefore, feminism is not an issue anymore, or like, you know, any, mm. you know, related, and I think he was making a good point about that, um, or at least that's what I got from it, and, you know, that's totally lost in the, in the hoopla now. Well, that is, I mean, that is a good point. I think that that's, that's something to, like, I just, God, that one Connor Friedrichdorf article, I just want to repeat it all the time, because it, it first summed up this beautiful, I hadn't thought of it in these terms, idea before, which is, my in summation of the thesis being that mostly the left we're talking about, they get angry about rhetorical, arguable sometimes, or, or blatant racism, sexism, what, what have you. And sometimes, you know, you, you shouldn't say everything all the time to anybody. Like, that's, that's not necessarily what you should do. You should, you know, being nice to people is fine. But the fact that the left cares more about how you talk than real-world policies that kill people, that uh, continues to piss me off. And I think that that's... I just, I just can't... Even if there's a good reason for outrage at this point, I'm so tired of it. I'm tired of getting mad about what someone said in some interview was about something. I don't... Unless it was legitimately like, I love Hitler or something... <laughs> Don't quote that out of context, please. Like, I don't know. Are you guys tired of outrage? Because I'm tired of outrage. The The Daily Show is going to use that clip. <laughs> Landing your name, Lucy. You better not mess up. It'll be uh, it'll be like what happens to poor Andy Levy all the time. <laughs> he tries to be humorous, and they're like, no, you're on Fox News. I'm sorry. You can't be joking. That's not allowed. Well, Gary, I mean, Gary Oldman calls himself a libertarian, but then didn't he say we should be not legalized in the same article. I miss He's kind of like, he's a, that happen? he's a libertarian the same way like Bill Maher is. But he said Bill Maher is a libertarian. And I appreciate when everyone says Bill Maher is not a libertarian because Lord knows he isn't. Right, but that doesn't necessarily mean Gary Oldman is either. <laughs> I feel like it's just something people like to say, especially like celebrities when they don't want to be associated with liberals anymore and you know, conservatives basically untouchable if you work in Hollywood, so... Uh, mm -hmm. I feel like it's just a, he it's did a say word. it was, like, it's the closest he came to. to use. Yeah, I mean, if you're in the neighborhood, Michelle, then, I mean, if you can't yeah. find another word that... I didn't... I missed any kind of, um, not against weed thing. He sure seems cranky, um, which is, I, I always enjoy. Um, I mean... <sighs> Clint Eastwood is kind of a libertarian as well. He, he's called himself that. But he also, you know, spoke 
to a chair and to the RNC that time. So, like, <laughs> there, there's a certain type of cranky old dude that is in the neighborhood of libertarian and I think is close enough that it's it's a refreshing change because Hollywood is not ideologically diverse ideologically diverse in the slightest. It's close enough that we're going to take it. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like this could be, have some negative effects. If we have, like, random celebrities starting calling themselves libertarian, but then, and so people are interested and, like, look about and look into them and find out if, the, did Gary Ullman really say he doesn't think weed should be legalized? I don't know! I don't, I don't know. I've read that somewhere. Maybe it's not true. They, like, they're going to be hesitant at... about libertarianism. If they're sane and they I mean, I guess if they don't think it should be legalized, I don't really give a shit about their opinion anyway. But <laughs> I mean, I mean um, you know, Bill Maher called himself a libertarian because solely because he thought weed should be legalized and probably prostitution. So, like, That's the only libertarian position, apparently. Indeed. Let's see. All right, play, let's see. Oh, wait, you know what? The Playboy interviewer actually said Bill Maher has called himself a libertarian. And then Gary Oldman said, I think he would fail the test. So that's something. Unlike Bill Maher, conservatives in Hollywood don't have a podium. That's true. Uh, he talks about Hillary Clinton being terrible. Also true. Picture of him dressed as being Sid Vicious. Um, political correctness. <sighs> I don't know. He's got like he's got some good points buried in some even I think is sort of awkward phrasing. But I don't know. I mean, there's a whole there's the whole political correctness like question there, and how how awful should we be in service of like making people stop freaking out all the time about everything? Well, it's pretty absurd, like you said. Like the mainstream left in the media and and, and the liberals, they 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 spend way more time talking about offensive things people say that are offensive than like actual institutional. Problems that go on because of the government. Uh, right. If they talk about, you know, what Gary Oldman said about something that didn't <laughs> actually hurt anybody, then Obama killing people overseas is, is silly. That's your mainstream college liberals for you. Yeah, it's like when Liam Neeson like spoke out against like the Blasio's like horse ban or whatever or banning. Mm -hmm. Oh, carriages. He didn't want horse yeah. and carriages because. Yeah, I think I read some things where like people like calling him like a libertarian. Like you take like one position, all the time. <laughs> like or like Jeremy. I think like Jeremy Irons was like on like the Huff Post couch or whatever, and he and he was like railing against smoking bans. Like oh, I was diehard as a libertarian. Yeah, and Joe Jackson, I remember, was mad at smoking bans, and Reason interviewed him, and it was still. I mean, I don't know. I don't know where the line is. It's maybe we should be flattered when people want to be libertarians, even if they're like not like Bill Maher. Um, I have a problem with yeah, Bill Maher yeah. doing it, but I'll take some of the other people. Yeah, Bill Maher yeah, pisses Bill me Bill off. Bill Maher's like a political kind of figure, like a he talking just, head. All he does is tell, like he's he just tries to tell everybody how stupid America is. And then the sycophantic audience is like. Yeah. It's like, aren't Americans stupid? <laughs> Woo! Well, here's, I found what Gary Oldman said about weed. Okay, lay it on us, Joe. He said, on legalizing marijuana, he said, it's silly to me, I'm not for it. Drugs are never my bag. I mean, I tried it once and it wasn't for me, though, unlike Bill Clinton, I did inhale. To me, the problem is driving. People in Colorado are driving high and getting DUIs. That's what I worry about. Listen, if you want to do cocaine, heroin, smoke, marijuana, that's fine by me. So. So he was being an inconsistent mess, inarticulate mess, basically. He's probably on marijuana when he said that. <laughs> I could make a coherent point. I don't think we should. Oh, my hands are so big. Oh, God. I mean, but I'm okay if people's idea of what a libertarian is is Gary Oldman versus, you know, like. I don't know, a Mitch McConnell. Because I've met people, you know, oh, isn't that Republican politician, you know, ex-libertarian? Uh, I'm like, no, <laughs> god damn it, no. Um, but, yeah, I'd rather have them think it's uh, Gary Oldman or, um, Jer or what is it, Jeremy Irons or whoever be a yeah. libertarian than that. I mean, it's, it's, it's one step closer to me, like, them eventually asking, like, oops, sorry. Um, <laughs> 
I forgot my point because I dropped my phone. But Vince yeah. Vaughn's libertarian too. Yeah. Right. He hangs out with uh, Ron Paul at the Ron Paul compound or whatever it's called. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Didn't Kelly Clarkson say she was, she was a libertarian once? She said she was up for Ron Paul and people yeah. were like, whoa, and yeah, the Twitter freaked got out. Mad. I'd be awesome. Yeah. I love Kelly Clarkson. I'd, I'd, be, I'd be happy to be a libertarian. Really? Okay. Yes, Rob Lowe, too. Rob Lowe. Uh, he used to be a liberal. I assume he must be a liberal douche because of the West Wing. Recently. And the people I know who watch it. No offense, all of my friends in Pittsburgh. Every he's single one of them. a recent uh, convertee to the libertarian scene, I believe. Mm. I feel like there's the hottest libertarian celebrities list. I'm, I'm working on it, actually. Yeah. <laughs> They're all just Joe. Right, Joe? <laughs> I'm not a celebrity. Not yet, you're not. Yeah, we Rob need Lowe, more hottest Rob, lists. Rob Lowe's my number one. Yeah, yeah. keep them coming. Yeah. Dynamite yeah, Austin Peterson. Two. Dynamite. Although Gary Oldman, like, he may not be, like, you know, the perfect libertarian, but he's definitely not going to be speaking at the Faith and Freedom Coalition every time. Yeah, yeah. and that, that is refreshing. True. And I think Eastwood, honestly, again, even though he did the RNC stuff and he can sound... He he gets off track because he's old and cranky, but he, he was... I don't know. I think he wasn't bad overall. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe like I feel like libertarians all we we're a little too like oh is he libertarian oh can we can we have him please please we pick him um, but like I totally get why um, I I wish that there were more libertarian musicians besides uh, what members of Blues Traveler who I accidentally installed on Twitter and John, then they John respond Potter. yeah I've been chatting with John Popper of Blues Traveler he uses a lot of emoticons a lot of winking ones um, so that's weird. But I made some sort of snotty remark about the whiteness of Blues Traveler, which in many ways is sort of true. But I also, I don't know, it's like that the Patton Oswalt bit about how he's old and therefore doesn't hate music anymore. But I do hate some music, but I didn't, I subtweeted him, man. He like, he broke the code of subtweeting. But I don't know. Blues, tra- Blues Travel dude, John Popper, he's um, been kind of friendly and amusing after I insulted him and sort of apologized. For- but um, there was a media article, I think he was on Fox News once, and he's like, Blues Travel dude is pretty good, but he's kind of a failure on intervention, I guess. And I was trying to tell him that if I, if he would just reconsider his stance on interventionism, I would listen to his entire catalog, which I would do if he really did change his ways on intervention, I would do that. But, you know, we'll see about that. We'll I see how that pans out. Way off on Blues Traveler this year. Quality band and The Hook is a great meta piece of music and you should read the AV, the uh, Onion AV Club article about it because mm. it reveals just how brilliant it is. Really? Yes. I mean, I just... I don't know. I probably shouldn't say any more in case I can actually entice him to do a podcast with me for Liberty.me, because I think that would be beautiful. And yeah, then I'll change the subject every time. All right, you do it then, Joe. We'll okay. make it happen. Maybe we'll both do it. I know things about Blues Channel, like the name of John Popper. I know his name now. <laughs> All right, well, we lost, we lost one of our two viewers because we talked too much about Blues Traveler. Ah. <laughs> Oh, well. Um, all right, libertarian celebrities and all that. I guess we should wrap this up. We kind of had a laid-back kind of... I mean, David, David, like, I texted him, like, five minutes before we started, and he was on board. So, um, you know, we had a good laid-back uh, panel today. Oh, you know what? What are you guys enjoying that's not politics this week? And I will start with... I enjoyed a lot of things that Corey likes for some reason. I read uh, Batman Year One, and that was awesome. And I watched the very original Godzilla, the Japanese cut of it, and that was awesome. And on to be less cool in my choices, I started watching uh, Nashville because it fills the hole in my heart that Instant Star left behind, which is a show that is more embarrassing than Degrassi because it's not campy enough to be an acceptable choice of viewing, but it's kind of entrancing. So I've been enjoying those things. Uh, Corey, what about you? I've been enjoying nothing. I've had the flu all week, and I've just been kind of 
dead. <laughs> well, that's sad. You should yeah. find something to make you feel better, like Batman. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Everything else say I was dead all week, pretty much. Well, that's rough, dude. All right, uh, David, what have you been enjoying out there in Mordor that is not politics? Um, well, for the longest time, I was very much anti-Fedora. Like, mm-hmm. I, I despised them, but <laughs> I, was, I recently kind of picked one up, and unfortunately, I'm very dear to it now. So, I flipped you up. Sh- Where is it? Do you have it near you? Uh, no, it's in my room over there, but it's just like... Is it a real fedora or, like, a trilby? Like, is it legit old man fedora? No, I got it at, like, Target. So, I don't know. I think you dropped the ball. You gotta get a proper one, an old-timey one. Yeah. Um, yeah. well, you know what? Hats are good. I think they get a... Even the trilby gets a bad hat. I love hat. that. Yeah. That's the best. All right, that's good. Uh, Joe, what about you? Uh, World Cup fever. I got it. <laughs> Slightly less, um, what's the word? I don't know. I was going to say something. <laughs> Sunday, what's the man. Word for when disease is uh, contagious. It's, yeah. it's contagious. <laughs> it's, has it spread to other people, or are you saying it spread to you? It's spread to me, and I've infected my roommates. Nice. Okay, that's good. Um, who are you rooting for to win the thing, the whole um, thing? I mean, I guess the USA, but not really, because they're boring. Uh, I think I, I'm, I'm going Germany. I'm going the Die Wandersnacht, or whatever their name is. Die De Wander Ostensfarge. Yeah, the motherland. I'm going back yeah. to Sounds good. Though we're, like, we're literally an eighth to German, so we have seven other motherlands to concern ourselves with, plus Canada. Well, Plus the United States. Vault is very German. Yeah, it's German. Uh, Michelle, what about you? Uh, World Cup as well. Uh, the NBA and NHL drafts were this week. Oh, that was good. fun. And then um, Wawa kicked off its like Welcome America festivities in Philly. It's going to be a week long leading up to the 4th of July concert. They always have cool stuff happening here. It, I, think it, I think Philly is one of the best places to spend um, 4th of July. It's yeah. just awesome. Yeah. I've spent 4th of July in different cities uh, over the past few years, and it's always been my favorite to spend it here in Philly. What is a socially acceptable libertarian way to spend the 4th of July? I mean, that's a big topic, but um, what do you like to do for it? Um, the few times I've been here in Philly, I've uh, gone to the concert and just hung out with friends and haven't really thought much about politics or any of that crap. It's just a... Uh, <laughs> excuse to go out and have a good barbecue or whatever, hang out with friends. That sounds good. Um, yeah, that's a lot. I think the Libertarian High Council will allow it. Man, that pump is loud and constant. I'm trying to ignore it. All right, um, I guess we're going to wrap this damn thing up. Um, if y'all want to promote yourselves, I will skip Joe and Michelle because they're awfully shy unless they uh, say otherwise. Corey! I know you're sick, so I shouldn't yell at you. Where can the people read your works? Uh, C4SS.org uh, and DLMagazine.org, I guess. Are you working on anything new and exciting, or just usual stuff? Um, same thing. Oh, no, <laughs> or- I'm intern at Liberty.me. I forgot. Yeah, I you tell me. That's pretty fun. <laughs> Everyone check out Liberty.me. It's a really... Oh, you're, you're probably on it, actually, watching this podcast. You're probably on it right now as you yeah, watch yeah. this. There's a really good chance. Or way. YouTube. <laughs> uh, David, where can the people uh, read what you do? Check me out at ForgottenBeard.wordpress.com because I'm too cheap to actually buy the domain. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, there, yeah. are, there, are, there are many legitimate websites that forget to buy donate mains. I need to put you on my blog roll. I think I keep forgetting that I'm a bad person. I apologize for that. Um, the people, as usual, can read my stuff at Rare and Anti-War and Vice, which is something I have to go work on because my column is up for tomorrow. Um, bragging. Pardon? I said quit bragging. Joe, listen, those of us who are not on the hottest libertarian list, we have to find <laughs> other ways to get our self-esteem, okay? Like, we haven't been blessed by Austin Peterson's opinions yet, so... Someday. 
I'm just, I just saw no one knows I'm a libertarian. Like <laughs> no, no one knows. Yeah. You're behind the scenes. You're gonna take over. It's fine. I'm yeah. not worried about you. Slowly but surely. That's what I'm mm-hmm. working at. I hope I'll I'll survive when you when you become queen of the of liberty. All right. I promise that next week I'll stop making fun of certain lists made by certain libertarian people. Because, you know, at least they're not the state. Um, uh, yeah, we'll do another one of these episodes real soon, and it'll be a little more prepared. But, you know, we took it slow. We did all right, I think. Um, I think our z- zero viewers will uh, attest to that. Thank you, Corey. Feel better soon. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Michelle. Enjoy your football. And thank you, David, for your last minute uh, jumping in. I appreciate that. All right, I'll see you guys next time on politics for people who hate politics. Bye. They pulled you over for, you know, a traffic stop or what have you, which leads to, uh, oh, are there any drugs in here? Oh, better search your phone. That's kind of the way of things. Um, the police used to have this great, easy way of searching a phone. Um, and I guess they won't anymore, which is awesome. Uh, the, the Supreme Court, particularly on the Fourth Amendment, has been kind of slow in terms of... Um, joining the 21st century and figuring out that, yeah, it's a little more than just your papers that uh, need to be protected by the government. It's also this kind of thing. Um, so that's good, right? I mean, I, I, I'm always surprised when the Supreme Court makes a good decision, especially about the Fourth Amendment. Um, do you guys have any thoughts to add to this? There are some other... There's some other police stuff um, recently that I can also talk about. <laughs> if you, uh, uh, my panel well, needs. Agree. Like, is anyone, does anyone thinks this, this was the wrong decision? I'm pretty sure it's, you know, the, the Supreme Court is. You know, well, right I was, on I was kind of surprised because they're usually pretty bad. With yeah, I mean, Alito dissented, but. It was a pretty sweeping decision. It was yeah. eight to one, so that's that's good. That shows at least that they're capable of reading the Fourth Amendment and you know, sort of upholding it even in this day and age. Yeah, and it bodes well for. Um, I, I mean, I, I I don't I couldn't speak to what this what else this might apply to, but um, you know. One of the big problems with the third party doctrine doesn't apply because they're going through your stuff, um, and you haven't, you know, you may have stuff that's in the cloud on your phone, but in order to search your little phone, I guess um, they decided that that, yeah, you need a damn search warrant. But I, I still think that getting rid of the third party doctrine would be. I don't know if there's anything that would be more helpful in this current, um, the current laws that we have to privacy than getting rid of the third party doctrine. And I don't know. What was the life expectancy when like the Supreme Court was set up? I wonder. Maybe we should have like a rule. <laughs> we need some young people for the Supreme Court. With like millennials in the Supreme Court? That just sounds like a sassy BuzzFeed article that would annoy a list that would annoy me greatly. I don't know. Whatever. We should, we yeah, should... <laughs> fifty ways to youth up the Supreme Court. <laughs> They had another one about, I, I don't even want to talk about it in case there are children here, Supreme Court Justice, sexy Supreme Court Justice. That was the day that I was done with BuzzFeed when the self-parody and parody was, um, it was, it was. They became one. It was a singularity type issue, they I never, think. It never looked back. Yeah. Um. Now, I'm, I, since I, I'm just going to talk at y'all a little bit more, I've been I've been reading about um, stingrays a bit in the last week. Speaking of more cop and spying stuff, and um, those are those things that your local police might have, and those um, capture sort of I don't know how many phones in an area. It's basically the equivalent of a cell phone tower, but it's not one. It's like a fake cell phone tower that can get metadata, you know, like all the metadata in, in an apartment building and such, if you turn it on. Uh, hi, welcome to Politics for People Who Hate Politics, episode six. I have no ability to retain how many episodes we've done, but um, so I always up talk about it. Today on the panel, we have usuals, Corey, Michelle, and Joe. Say hi to the people. 
Hello. <laughs> They're very unenthused today, but I'm Great going to. to uh... Shut up, Joe. Mom says make her bed. I um, <laughs> and we also have David Lowenthal, who fails at lower thirds, but we still like him anyway. Yeah. Um, he has a blog called The Forgotten Beard, and we'll ask him to promote that at the end, as we like promoting things here. And one time he was an intern at the Cato Institute, and we hung out, and he recently moved to Mordor. How is Mordor, by the way, David? Uh, uh, Weather-wise, actually, not its worst. <laughs> I, guess, I guess you could put it, but uh, otherwise, it's, it's Mordor for you. Yep. That's that, that, that uh, about gels with my memory of the place. Yeah. Okay. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about this fine Sunday evening is some stuff about the popos, which is, I suppose, my specialty. But in a world with Radley Balco, that's not uh, it's not doing much for me. Um, this uh, last week, the Supreme Court basically actually joined the 21st century finally and decided that you need a warrant to search someone's cell phone. And they had a whole, but they previously had this whole procedure. Uh, oh Lord, in search incident to arrest, there was a whole thing where they could search your phone. And obviously, in this, um, with um, you know, te technology and protecting all your shit in this day and age, is the third party doctrine. Which comes from a, I think it's like 1979. They first, um, with phone records, you know, just like landliney old school phone records. Um, and basically, the third party doctrine says it ain't your papers if you um, shared the information willingly with the third party, be that a uh, phone company or what have you. And obviously, that's been really bad in an era of cloud computing and and other things. And that's one reason why the um, the NSA thinks that they can do giant cell phone dragnets because, or phone dragnets and spine dragnets because you turned it over anyway. But, um, so I don't know. I guess this bodes well. Right. It's ironic because they kind of missed the boat on the whole Aereo decision, which came out the same day. Yes. But they don't really, I don't think they really understand technology. That's one of the dangers of having a bunch of old people on the Supreme Court. Forever, mind you. Yes. Right, forever. So they're going to be, you know, making these decisions that greatly affects all of Americans. And they probably, do they even know, who knows what they know about technology, what, what they know about cloud computing and all this. It seems kind of dangerous to leave it all in their hands, but, you know, it looks like, at least on privacy, they're kind of erring against the you know, dragnet and the whole... Yeah, know. I mean, they have a lot of... There's a lot of bad precedent, though, that um, that they have to... With the, with the cell phone search, you know, if the police have your phone, I think, outside. And I have no idea if those... Those might have the same... Um, the, the same problem. Like, this, this, this might actually bode well, this decision for those as well, because... Arguably, you're also going directly. You're not going to the cell phone company to get records in that. It's more direct, and therefore, this decision might actually make those uh, not legal. But we don't even know who's doing them, so I don't know. I don't know. You have to know what people are up to before you can decide, you know, if it's going to be legal or not. And that's why the government doesn't want to know what you're up to. Well, I mean, the government doesn't want us to know what it's up to either. I mean. The, if they don't, if nobody knows about these things, then nobody can, you know, they can't really be illegal because no one knows that they're there and they're just going to keep doing it. And they're always going to, you know, be looking for ways around, you know, and whether or not the Supreme Court or whatever rules that they are, you know, something like this would be illegal. You know, until it gets to them, they're just going to keep doing things like this and keep going around until it's illegal. Then they'll just yeah. find something else. And there's really no, we're, we're all screwed again. Yeah, it kind of comes down to, I mean, this is the best news on spying we've had in a while. Um, you know, and it applies obviously not, it's not just about la uh, confining one agency. And this is, you know, this is an actual protection for all of us. Um, so this is good. You know, there's, 
there's always a little bit of good news, even when the government's out there. But there's a lot of there's a lot of worrisome things as well. And a, bad, a lot of bad Supreme Court 